Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. And, Lord, we just want to pause now and just come into your presence and just say, Lord, we are a needy people. Lord, we're just like lumps of coal, Lord, without, without your lighter fluid, without your spark. So, Lord, we just pray for uh, this service today, that, Lord, you'd be glorified. Lord, you know everyone here. You love everyone here. You have died and paid for everyone's sins here as well. And, Lord, there's nothing that you don't know about us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And, Lord, I know you know every whimper. Every heart cry, every heartache, every fear, every insecurity, Lord, there's nothing that you don't know about our lives, and Lord, you love us the same, and we just praise you for your great love and how it surpasses our understanding as you tell us in Ephesians, and Lord, I just pray with all my heart for these requests that, that you've heard that have been lifted up, Lord, I just lift each and every one of them up to you as if they were my very own, Lord, and I just pray with all my heart that you would attend to each and every one of these, that Lord, your will would be done in each and every one of these, and that Lord, you would grant everyone's petitions here to be answered according to your will Lord, we need you we just pray that your word would be magnified today that lord you would refresh us you would remind us lord i pray that you would just truly take uh handles and this lord let us put these handles on the text of scripture and the word of god so that we have a better understanding of it and we're able to be able to hold on to it lord with the understanding so lord i know that comes by your holy spirit and I pray that you'll do that very thing. Refresh us, remind us. Lord, help us to be soul winners. Lord, thank you for this church. We just pray for the wisdom of the leadership. We just pray as we move forward. Uh, Lord, as you will help us to uh, walk in each and every one of your steps. We just pray that you'll continue to use this church as a salvation station where the gospels preach. Lord, that you'll use it as a greenhouse where people can grow in the grace and knowledge of your word. And that, Lord, people will be launched into ministry, Lord, in serving you. Thank you for all that they do behind the scenes. Thank you for these that are here today. And, Lord, we just say to you that we're needy. We're nothing without you. Touch me. Anoint me. Lord, use me. Help me to teach your word and your power with your ability. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. I know we were doing a little bit of refreshing, and we're going to get into the signs, but, but a couple things that we didn't get to cover, and, and, and honestly, I'm kind of glad it's hidden. I asked a question before concerning the underworld. Now, we've talked about hell. We've talked about, you know, paradise. We've talked about Hades and, and how this side is still there, but the paradise side is now empty because Christ died was raised from the dead the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin so god had to have the righteous in a temporary holding area in paradise well when christ died on the cross and the veil was ripped in two christ was able to escort those into the presence of god himself because his blood was shed so the bible says that he led all those that were captive out of captivity and he brought them into heaven and the Word of God says that people that still die, their soul will temporarily go to Hades' hell, this holding area, the county jail, if you will. And they're waiting for the great white throne judgment to be cast into the lake of fire. So, but the question I ask is, is where does the teaching of purgatory come from? Where, where does the Catholic Church get the teaching of purgatory? Does anybody know what the teaching of purgatory is? Is anybody here not familiar with it? Okay, purgatory. Purgatory is basically a place in between heaven and hell. You don't go to hell, but you go to purgatory. And purgatory is like hell, where you'll, you'll, you'll pay for your sins. You'll burn for however long it takes for whatever determined amount of time each sin uh, brought. This is what Catholics teach. Whatever, what, whatever sin brought and how much time is added to that, uh, you'll have to go to purgatory, burn and pay for your sins, and then when you're done then you'll be allowed to get into heaven. That's what they think. So basically, it's like a holding area where you, you're punished, you have to pay for the things that you didn't confess, all those kind of things, and then afterwards, you're good to go. And that's how the whole system works when it comes to the Catholicism. Now, guys, I'm not picking on Catholic people. My mom was raised a Roman Catholic, and she got born again. But Catholicism is a, is a, is a, is a religion that teaches you get to heaven by good works, and you don't get to heaven by good works, period. So we're not against Catholic people, but I am against the teaching. Why? Because the Lord's Bible, his book, the Bible, the Holy Bible, is against the teaching of what they teach. I've studied the Vatican. I've studied uh, Roman Catholicism. I've studied it very thoroughly. And, and it's just basically organized idolatry, guys. And that's not being mean. That's just telling the truth. Amen? So there was an old saying if you look at their cathedrals, their cathedrals are massive. If you look at the Vatican City, that, that, that's a massive place. It costs a lot of money to build those things. 
Well, a lot of how they got their money, unfortunately, was that they, they sold indulgences. They would go around selling indulgences and saying, hey, listen, if you, you, know, you commit adultery, you just buy this indulgence, you can indulge in it because it's already been paid for. Boy, isn't that convenient. Boy, that's not good. And then the other thing was they used to go around, some of the, the priests used to go around with a coffer, and they would say, into the coin, the coffer uh, rings. Out of purgatory, a soul will spring. And so you'll see even today. If you go to some Catholic churches, they have candles. They have places that you can give money. And they believe that when you put money in these things, that you're taking time off the sentence of people that are in purgatory. So if you'll pay a certain amount of money, you can take this much time off the person. Now, who, if you, if you don't have a Bible and you're ignorant and you're looking to your priest who's supposed to know the Word of God, this is why they call that time in our history called the Dark Ages. Remember that? It wasn't because it didn't have electricity. It was because they kept the Bible, the light, from the people of God and kept them ignorant and would scare them to death with these things. And, but they would say, but if you, hey, if you give a certain amount of money, well, well, hey, you're, you're a relative. Well, who wouldn't want to do that if you're ignorant and don't know God's word? So I'm not beating these people up at all, but the teaching is horrible. And so this is where a lot of these things were built. Now, where do they get that teaching from? Where does it come from? All right, go in your Bible to... To, in your Bible to Peter. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. Now, I know we covered this once, but I, like I said, I want people to be refreshed. There's a lot that we've covered. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to remember. So I, I just don't ever want to be that fire hydrant. I want to slow down and let you guys be able to drink and, and see where we're going. All right, let's read, what, let's, let's read what 2 Peter chapter uh, 2, verse 4 says. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sin, now we remember these angels are the ones that sin in Genesis chapter 6. It says they forcefully took wives unto themselves, and their offspring were the Nephilim. What does that word Nephilim mean? It means fallen ones. So you had this hybrid half angel, half human, and the Bible says they were giants. The Bible says that they were men of renown, and God wanted all those giants killed. Boy. And if you look in Jude, hold your place there in Second Peter before we read that. Go, go to Jude real quick. Now that we're on the subject, I feel like I need to explain it a little bit more just for a refresher. All right, let's, let's go down there to verse 5 of Jude, verse 5 of the book of Jude. All right, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, man, he says up there too in verse 1, man, I, I would rather write to you about our common salvation. However, man, I've got to write to you about what an apostate looks like. And the book of Jude is the apostate files, if you will. And he gives a perfect description of what apostate a preacher looks like. But in the middle of all this, let's look at verse 5. He says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now look at verse 6. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, or their proper abode, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner... In like manner of to what? In like manner of what these angels did. And these angels went after strange flesh in the book of Genesis. We discussed this. But he's comparing the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah to the sin of these angels. And when you look in the Greek, it's absolutely connected together. You cannot unweld it. So he's tying these two events together. And he's comparing the sin of these angels who left their proper abode, did something that was horribly, horribly wrong, it says they took wives forcefully to themselves and they had their offspring, the men of renown, those giants, the Nephilim, the fallen ones is what that literally means. And then you'll notice how God wanted them all destroyed. He wanted them all wiped out, and he did. So notice what it says. Even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to what? Fornication, immorality, and going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So strange flesh for a human would be a man laying with a man or a woman lying with a woman. God says that's an abomination. God says it's homosexuality. God says it's sin. That's what God calls it, period. There's no other way to call it except for what God calls it, amen? 
But he compares the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah to what those angels did. And it says he cast them down to what? In chains of darkness. Now, where is this place at? All right, go back to 2 Peter now. 2 Peter. Let's go back there. And let's look at verse 4 of 2 Peter, chapter 4. It says, For if God spare not the angels that sin, but listen to this, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, if you read over this in the English, you're going you're to read just like we just read. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell. Now, when people think of hell in the Bible, they think of what? They think of this place right here. They think of the place where the people that die without Christ temporarily go until they're pulled up out of here to stand before the great white throne judgment, and then they're cast into the lake of fire. So, but most people think of the word hell or Hades when they think of that word right there in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. But if you look up that word, it's not the word Hades, it's the word Tartarus, where we get the word Tartarus from. And Tartarus was a Greek place that, that Greeks believed that people would go to, that, that these, these mythical creatures would go to that did horrible things. They called that place Tartarus. But the Word of God uses Tartarus. It's the only time it's using the Word of God, and it's talking about this special place that these angels sin, and he put them in the prison of Tartaru or Tartarus. These fallen angels went to this place. They're in chains waiting for the judgment day, the great the, the judgment of God when their Satan and his angels are all cast into the lake of fire. So, but a lot of people get that confused, but that's where the teaching of purgatory comes from. Because, because if you look in 1 Peter, it says that Jesus Christ went down into prison and spoke preach to the spirits that were in prison in first peter it says that all right so he went down to prison and he preached to the spirits that were in prison so that's the other place that they get this teaching from is from first peter and also here in second peter chapter 2 verse 4 and they say that you know jesus went and preach you see to the spirits that were in purgatory to those that were in prison why because he was down there giving them hope that, hey, listen, you're just going to have to suffer a little while. You'll get out of here. And then once you get out of here, you'll be able to go to heaven. That's purgatory. That's what they teach purgatory is, and that's where they get that. Well, when you look up the word he preached to the spirits that were in prison, well, we know that that prison is to Tartarus because when you look at Jude and when you look at Peter, it tells us that very clearly. And the word preach is not the same word used for the gospel. It's completely different. It's not the good news. So we don't know what Jesus said to those fallen angels that messed up in Genesis chapter 6, but maybe he says something like this, you're done. And you need to stick a fork in it, amen? Because, man, I've already paid for the world's sins on Calvary's cross, and I'm about to be raised up from the dead on the third day. So he went down there and preached a message to those angels that did what they did. Now, most scholars believe the angels did that in Genesis chapter 6 because of what Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says. I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. Remember that? He shall bruise your heel and he'll crush your head. Remember that? Well, then Satan knew that his doom was going to come through a woman because God told him in Genesis 3, 3, 15 that through her seed, and we know that Galatians says that that seed was Christ that he would, that, that, that was talking about. So we believe, I believe, that Satan was trying to pollute the bloodline. And by doing that, to mess up the fact that a woman or this seed of this woman could come and crush his head. So he tried to pollute the bloodline. The Bible says it happened during or before the flood, and it says it happened after the flood again. They did the same thing again, but he put them in this prison for doing it, the Bible says. Are you with me? All right. So don't get purgatory confused, boy. Also, Catholics believe in the Virgin Mary. Is, is the Virgin Mary still a virgin? No. Why? Because the Bible says she had what? Children. Other children. With Joseph. Amen? Boy. And what did, what did Mary say when she found out that she was pregnant with Jesus? What did she say? Boy, this is key now. This is a verse that you need to take people to. What did she say when she found out she was pregnant? She began to praise God, right? And she said, my soul exalts God my Savior. Why would she call God her Savior if she didn't need saving? Amen? So to admit that God is your Savior is to admit that you're a sinner. Amen? Boy, also, Catholics believe 
that uh, Peter was the first pope. But Catholics also believe that you can't be married if you're a priest or a pope. What's that? Peter was married, though, wasn't he? How do we know he was married? Because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. You can't have a mother-in-law unless you're married, right? Boy. And what does the Bible say in Timothy that the two doctrines of demons are? The Bible names two doctrines that came from devils. So it just goes to show you that even demons can influence people's writing. Because God says it was written in a book, and he put it in the Bible and said, these are two doctrines of devils, two doctrines of demons. And unfortunately, the Catholic Church embraces both of them. One is to abstain from eating meats, and the other is to abstain from marriage. Boy, forbidding people to marry, that is wrong. God established marriage in the garden. And he said, what God has joined together, let what? No man separate. Amen? Amen. Boy, so he established what marriage was. One man, one woman, and holy matrimony before the Lord. Amen? Yes, indeed. So, when you look at God's word, very quickly you'll begin to be able to tear down these false citadels that Satan tries to build, these erroneous ideas. If you look at Satan too, man, he, attacked, he attacks the bloodline of Christ not only by having his angels do what they did but also man through persecution and all kinds of things you realize that the line of Christ got down to one person in history one person remember that evil queen that killed all her kids and that nurse took took that child and she hid it well that that child was in the line of Christ and so the line of Christ got down to one person in history and if that woman had got a hold of that child that child would have been murdered and and killed but God preserved his line. But you can see Satan's attack. You can look at Herod. What did Herod do? Two years and under, man. So there was another attack on the bloodline of Christ. So you can see where Satan attacks constantly. Boy. So please understand, as we were moving through this, I wanted to make sure that this, this part of the calendar was cleared up. All right. Now you see this right here? This abyss, this bottomless pit right here that Satan's cast into? Let me go to this part of the, of the screen. Let me see here if I can get back up. All right. Now, you hear me say a lot of times when we're going through this. Well, the, next, the next great event on, on the church is going to be what, church? What's the next great event going to be? The rapture, right? And then right up here is going to be, right after the rapture is going to be what, church? The, the judgment seat of Christ, right? That's going to happen right here during this seven years of trouble when we're in heaven. Israel's going through the tribulation. The world's going through the tribulation. But then at the end of the tribulation, we know that Jesus comes back with the saints. We know that Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's cast into the pit. And then after the thousand years is over, he's released. Now, where do we get all that in the Bible? You've heard me say that how many times? A bunch, right? Where does all that come from? Who can tell me where to go find any of what I just said? What's that? Some of it's in Ezekiel. But go, go in your Bible to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Go in your Bible to Revelation 19. I want you to see where a lot of this comes from. Revelation 19. It says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power under the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of her servants at her hand. Who is the great whore of Babylon? Who is that? The Bible talks about the great whore of Babylon. Now that's not a, that's not a nice word, is it? Boy, it's not. But God, that's exactly what God uses and says of that harlot, Babylon. The Babylon is, at one time, it was a physical place, right? The city of Babylon. God says it would be wiped out and never be rebuilt. It's not even rebuilt to this day, amen? He's talking about, then you also have the Tower of Babel. Remember that, Tower of Babel? That's where all false religions got started. That's where Satan planted his seed, was right there, boy. And that's where all them false religions came from, the Tower of Babel. So you have that one, you have the city. But now he's talking about the spiritual city, if you will, spiritual Babylon this world system that's made up of religion 
politics, economics, this whole world system that's corrupt. And boy, if you haven't been watching the news, man, America is absolutely corrupt from head to toe right now in the government that, that, that's up there. Boy, it's bad, guys. It's bad. We're hemorrhaging on all sides. But that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that, that the world system, this corrupt system that we live in that's perishing, the Bible says. All right, so let's keep reading. What's that? The whore of Babylon is this world system, this corrupt system. Yes, and it's made up of religion, economics, politics, all of that mixed together is this world system. It's this new Babylon, if you will. All right, and then it says this. For true and righteous are his judgments. Now, he's talking about the Lord here. For he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And 24 elders and four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters, the voice of the mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent or all-powerful reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. That's talking about the church. Now the church in this particular chapter is in heaven with the Lord right now. Every saint that died in Christ or that was alive during the rapture is found in Revelation chapter 19. We know that because the Bible says in Jude that when Jesus comes back to the battle of Armageddon, that all of his saints are coming with him. Amen? Now, you'll not read about the church from chapter 4 of Revelation until you get to chapter 19. So that whole time between those two chapters is dealing with Israel. In fact, if you read the book of Daniel, and then you were to read the book of Revelation, kind of like back to back, and you, you take out chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, and you start reading Revelation chapter 4 to, verse, to chapter 19. So read Daniel chapter 1 through 12, and then read Revelation chapter 5 through 18, and you'll see yourself reading about Israel, not the church at all. Amen? Why? Because the church is gone. The church has been raptured. The church is in heaven. So let's keep reading. I love this, man. I love this. Boy, this is so good. It says, verse 8, And to her, the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, look, I love this. Listen to what it says. For the fine linen, a bride's dress, right? God's saying that this bride's dress, his church, us, the ecclesia, the called out ones, those of us that have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and soul. The church, listen to what he says, that our dress is made out of man this is awesome guys it says and to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white for the fine linen is what boy is the righteousness or the righteous acts of the saints isn't that awesome man and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he saith unto me these are the true sayings of god and I fell at his feet to worship him. He's talking to an angel, John. He's on the island of Patmos. He's receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the what? The Word of God. Where do we see that at? John, right? In Genesis as well. John, in the beginning was the Word. Boy, do you see it right there? His name is the Word of God. That's why the Bible says all things were made by him and through him, and everything was made by what? The Word of God. 
So it's not just a voice that God speaks. Jesus is the voice of God. He is the Word of God. Amen? The living Word of God. Boy. And praise God, he's given us the written Word. And then he says this. Well, I love this, man. It says in verse 12, His eyes were a flame of fire. What color were his eyes? Does it say blue in there anywhere? Does it say brown or green or turquoise or hazel? Does it say that? So the next time somebody tells you that they saw Jesus and he had blue eyes, you can say, no, that's not true because the Word of God says that right now, the way he exists and the way he looks, and Revelation chapter 1 will back it up because it talks about his description in there as well, that he has flames of fire. His feet are like bronze that were bronze in, in, in a furnace of fire. Boy, our God is a consuming fire. Amen? Boy. So I'm telling I'm not trying to be mean to people, but listen, don't tell me that you saw a blue-eyed Jesus because you didn't, because the Word of God says that he has eyes that are like a flame of fire. Amen? Boy. Yes, indeed. And I think there's a reason why the Lord didn't give a detailed description about how Jesus looked, because he knows how prejudiced people are. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In fact, does the, Bible, does the Bible teach that Jesus was good-looking or ugly? And that's a simple way to put it, but I, and I'm not being disrespectful, but I'm, I'm asking a, a serious question. What's that? Nothing, yeah, no, no, nothing to desire that he should be looked upon. Now, he could have made himself look like anybody he wanted. He could have made himself the best-looking guy the world's ever seen. But everything he did was what? Humble, humble. Did he come on a white stallion or a donkey? Hey, Amen. Everything was humble. Was he born in the hospital or was he born in the side of a mountain in a cave with stinky animals present? Now, you pick. Where would you want to be born? On the side of a, of a mountain in a cave with stinky farm animals or would you rather be born in a nice hospital? Amen. Everything he did was humble. There was no room in the inn. Are you serious? The God that made the universe? The whole entire universe who made all the space, who gave you the space that you're living in right now, there was no room for him? Yes, ma'am. Right. I do believe that he's giving a description the best he can of what he's seeing and what Jesus looks like. It says like a flame of fire. It didn't say they are a flame of fire, but they're like a flame of fire. But... Well, Jesus has a body. Right. We know. We do know that it can go through walls because he appeared in that locked room after he was raised from the dead. We do know. He said, "Hey, uh, Thomas, man, reach here in my side, because a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have." So he says he has flesh and bones, but that's a different type of flesh. Well, no, when, when he was raised from the dead, yes, he had his new body, his ascended body, and, and we are going to have that same body. What's that? Yeah, the disciples knew him. That's correct. And he said, hey, and then he also still retained his nail-scarred hands. We know that. And his, his nail-scarred feet. We, we know that he retained that. But we also know that he ate fish. He ate bread. But we also know that he disappeared. He vanished. He appeared in locked rooms. You know, so he has a body. It's a celestial body. And the Bible says that we're going to be just like him. We're going to have the same body that he has. But to give all the details of it, no. But when somebody says that Jesus has blue eyes and brown hair and it's, all, and it's, and it's really long and all this stuff, man, that's, that's not the Bible, man. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was what? He was marred. The Word of God says in Hebrew that he was marred more than any man. You know what that word marred means in the Hebrew? It means that he was beat beyond recognition. You couldn't even recognize the fact that he was a man anymore. Now, I know there was a movie called The Passion, and that was probably the best depiction of the, uh, of the crucifixion that the world's ever seen. But however, when you look at Scripture, and when you look at culture, when you look at history, it was even worse than the movie portrayed. Boy. In other words, one man said it, and I agree with him. When, when he, he, he introduced Jesus after he was, he was cat of nine tailed across his chest, their back, the back of their legs. Man, could you, imagine getting, could you imagine a wooden stick this long that was flexible? And man, and having that crack, 
crack right across the back of your thighs and the back of your back back of your calves and across your back. Oh well, he was a Jew, so he only got thirty nine uh, lashings. No, it was under Roman providence, and Romans would beat you to death. Boy, boy. So he goes on and he says this in verse 13 and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and he is called the word of God and then it says and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses that's speaking of us and angels clothed in fine linen white and clean well the word of God told us what that fine linen white and clean was in verse 8 then he says this in verse 15 and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that's speaking of his word that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God now you remember what we talked about the fierceness of the winepress of the wrath of almighty God you remember that in the Kidron Valley and the Kidron Valley is where the garden of Gethsemane is right and the Kidron Valley is located right here where Jerusalem's at right here in the middle of Israel and the word of God says that if you look at the Garden of Gethsemane, when you look that word up, it means to press. Now, I've taught you this, but it means to press, right? So when you press olives, what comes out? Oil, right? And it's really cool how they do that. They got three different pressings, and this, this batch is for this use, and this second batch is for this use, and the third batch is for that use. It's really, really cool. But what's interesting is, is Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which means to press, and Jesus was pressed at the garden of Gethsemane was he not all the sins of the world began to mount up well they were coming from from Adam to the last person to ever be born and all of those sins like black arrows were making their way into the body of Jesus from through all time because the Bible says he died one time for sin forever his death can never be repeated think about the holy son of God who can't sin who didn't sin the holy God of the universe having his body filled with everybody's sin that wasn't his own boy you know the bible says that when he was crucified that it was dark it grew dark there was an earthquake i mean it was a huge event but think about what he went through man boy my sin your sin all the sins of the world man being downloaded on him that's why he had to be the god man to be able to pay for our eternity in a finite short amount of time on Calvary's cross. He paid for our eternity in six hours that he hung on the cross. Why? Because he was an infinite being, but at the same time, he was also what? Fully human. Amen? Boy, yet without sin, and praise God for that. Now notice what it says in verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, he treadeth the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God. Now, why did I pause there? Now, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that he sweated, as it were, great drops of what? He was being pressed. He was being pressed. God is going to use that same place right here in Revelation 19, the same place to press the people that are coming to Armageddon. Because you're going to read that God is going to slay them by the sword of his mouth. The rest of the people that come, he's going to slay them by the breath of his mouth. They're going to all drop dead. And the Bible says that the blood is going to flow 180 stadia. What is that? That's 200 miles. And the word of God says it's going to happen right there in the valley of Kidron where the garden of Gethsemane and all that's at, that press. So this is going to be the physical wine press of the wrath of God, but also... If you keep reading in Revelation 14, he also talks about another wine press of the wrath of God, and that's talking about the lake of fire itself. So there's a physical one, and there's also that spiritual one. This is going to be at the Battle of Armageddon, and the Bible says that the blood is going to flow from, from Jerusalem, from the Kidron Valley. It's going to be about, about five feet high to the bridle of a horse, the Bible says. That's how many... you got you got to remember, guys, the Bible says that... the the Euphrates Rivers is going to dry up. In fact, it's drying up right now. It's drying up right now as we speak. It says that there's going to be a 200 million man march coming from Asia, coming from the east. Could you imagine 200 million people? Well, that's a lot of people. Have you ever been to a stadium with 20,000 people? Could you imagine being in a stadium with 50,000 people? But we're talking 200 million. And that's just from Asia. That's not talking about Russia and the United States and all these other countries that are converging on Israel. 
So no wonder why the blood could be that thick, that high, and run and flow that far. It says it's going to flow from, from right here. Now, this, is, this right here is where the Battle of Armageddon takes place right here. The Valley of Jezreel. You have Mark Carmel where uh, Elijah did all that. But this valley right here is where it's going to take place. But then it's going to move down to Jerusalem, a big part of it. And God's going to speak and crush all those people. And it says their blood's going to flow from Jerusalem all the way to the Jordan, down through the Dead Sea, all the way down to the Red Sea. Boy. So in other words, it pays to be saved. It pays to know the Lord Jesus. Amen? Let's keep reading because this is not something that you like reading about. I've got family and friends and people that need to be saved. Then it says this. It says in verse 16, And on his vesture and on his thigh was the name written, The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly into the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free, bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So you have the Antichrist in verse 19. He gathers his allies, these kings of the earth. Their armies are gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, de which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. There it is. And the remnant were slain. Now notice what he says. And the remnant of all those that remain in that battle, that were still there at the battle of Armageddon. Now let's read this verse again. The remnant. Notice what it says. The remnant. It says this. It says, And the remnant that were slain, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So not only is the Lord going to kill the Antichrist by the breath of his mouth, but he says all those that remain, he's also going to slaughter that received the mark on their right hand or their forehead as well. And it's going to be that remnant, which is a huge remnant, that meant all that blood is going to start flowing to the, to the, to, down to the Dead Sea. Boy. All right, let's keep reading. In verse chapter 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him. How many years? A thousand years, boy. All right, so battle of Armageddon's going on. All that, all that chaos is going on. The rapture's taking place. Man, the battle of Armageddon's going on. Jesus comes back with his angels. He comes back with us. And then, then the beast and the false prophet are immediately cast into the lake of fire. They're the first ones to go to Gehenna. That's that word, Gehenna hell. They're the first ones there. They're the only ones there. And they're going to be there how many years, church? A thousand years. All right, where do we get that from? Well, we just learned where this bottomless pit comes from. It's not the first time that it's talked about. When the demons were confronted by Jesus and uh, Gadara, the maniac from Gadara that could snap change, remember that? Remember, what he, remember when he was talking to the demons, what they said? Have you come to cast us into the abyss before the time? Remember that? Boy. So here's this abyss. This is where we get that from. All right, let's keep reading. It says, And he laid hold of that dragon, that old serpent, verse 2, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a what? That's how we know. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their forehead or their hands. Notice it says hands. And they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Who, who, who reigned and lived with Christ for a thousand years? Who got beheaded? All these people during the tribulation that didn't receive the mark on their right hand or their forehead. It says 
that they were resurrected and allowed to go into the millennial kingdom and they'll be priests unto God. Amen? So that's, what we, that's how we get that group. When we get to the chart, that's how we know. This is how we know how many different groups of people go into the millennial kingdom. The Old Testament saints, those of us that were raptured, those of us that died in Christ first, those of us that are alive and remain, the church saints are going to be there, the Old Testament saints are going to be there. We just got done reading that the tribulation saints are going to also be resurrected and have the privilege to go into the millennial reign. Amen? Are you with me? All right, so let's keep reading. Then it says this. Look at verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Do you see that? So that's how we know the tribulation saints are going to be there as well in the 1,000 year reign of Christ. But did you notice what it says? It says in verse 5, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Who, who, who is that? Who, who are all these other dead that didn't live until a thousand years later? The mark of the beast, people. All those that die without Christ. That's why it says, Blessed is he who has part in the what? The first major huge resurrection, which is going to be what? The rapture of the church. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Those of us that are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen? Boom. There's that first resurrection. Blessed is he who has part in that. He also allows these saints, these tribulation saints that lost their head, that died, he also is allowing them to be a part of the first resurrection as well. Amen? He's also going to allow the Old Testament saints to be a part of the resurrection because the millennial reign deals with, is, is the millennial reign for the church or for Israel? How many people say the church? All right. How many people say the millennial reign is specifically designed for Israel? I'm, it's, it's for Israel. More specifically for Israel. Why? Why is the millennial reign more for Israel than it would be for the church? Now, we're going to rule and reign with Christ. It's part, we're, we're part of it. Don't get me wrong. He's making us a part of it. But the big reason why the millennial reign exists is for what? We've talked about this. Give Israel, give Israel a chance to repent. What else? Because has Israel possessed all the land that God promised them? No, they haven't. Is God a liar? No. So is God going to keep his promise and give them all the land that he promised? And when's he going to do that? During the millennial reign. Amen. Are you with me? All right. All right, so let's keep going. It says in... Uh, Verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be what? So, oh, let me go back. So, the millennial reign, when it's over, right here, Satan is loosed from his prison again, the Bible says. And why is he loosed from his prison? Look at verse 8. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and, isn't that interesting how he calls this battle Gog and Magog too? Ezekiel 38 and 39 is also called the Battle of Gog and Magog as well. Isn't that interesting? Boy. So here he's talking about the spirit of it. Just that hate, that hate towards Israel and that hate, that anti-Semitic that, that, that Jews uh, deal with on a daily basis from, from most of the people in the world. Boy. That's why I believe he calls it Gog and Magog. Just, it's, it's, it just represents that hate. And then it says this. It says, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Now, here's another battle, boy. The number of whom is as what? So what's taking place during the millennial reign according to the word of God? What's taking place during this whole thousand years? Babies are being born. Boy, did you see that? How do we know that babies are being born? What does the Bible just say? And the number of whom is as the what? The sand of the sea. So you have a thousand years. Think about how long. You, think about how long you've lived right now. Now, some of you will say that some of my life feels like it's flown by. 
And then some of you would probably say, but there's parts of my life that feel like it took an eternity to get to where I'm at. Would you agree with that? Time is relative, is it not? And how, how fast you feel that it flies by. You know, a young man with a pretty girl, a minute's going to seem like a second. But if you're sitting on a stove for a minute, it's going to feel like an eternity, amen? Boy. So just keep think, think of it that way. And so when you look, it says in verse 9, and they went up to the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. How sad is that, guys? Don't just skip past that part. You've had people who were on planet earth for a thousand years whose lives been extended for that long right who are supposed to come to, wor to worship the bible teaches us during the millennial reign They're, every nation is going to be required to come at least once a year to pay homage to the lord and god's word says that they don't come he'll cause it not to rain on their land he'll do different things to get their attention to, to get them to wake up to get them to come but think about a thousand years, man, being and seeing his nail-scarred hands, seeing the presence of, of Jesus, and then still rebelling against him when he comes. And is it, is, is it a small rebellion? No, man, it's a huge rebellion, yes. Well, this thousand years is, is actually a thousand years that will be under 360 days, not 365 days. Keep that in mind. Anytime you study Bible prophecy, period, it's always on a 360-day calendar, not a 365-day calendar, okay? Keep that in mind. Always a 360-day calendar when it was written, all right? So let's keep it. So it says, and they went up. The breadth of the earth, verse 9, encompassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet. And we learn what from this teaching? What do we learn from this teaching? And Satan was cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet. So what does that teach us? They're still there. And how long have they been there? So if anybody denies the reality of hell and wants to teach you that you, you, you get annihilated or you go poof when you get there, this is the very verse that you take them to and say, no. Word of God says they're still there. They're still alive. They're still fully conscious, and now Satan's with them. Boy, all right? Not that this chapter 21 just teaches that, no, but, but on a side note, it's good to pay attention to that. Amen? Yeah, so, so Satan is put into this pit right here at the end of the tribulation he gets put into the pit uh, the false prophet and the antichrist are also uh, put into the lake of fire so Satan and his angels go to the pit antichrist the false prophet go into the lake of fire and then after that thousand years man Satan's released his demons are released he gathers all the fakes and phony he gives all those that gave lip service instead of heart service gathers them together to, to fight in this battle we don't lift a finger God does all the fighting fire comes down out of heaven devours them all the Bible says and then it says this where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and boy man you think about forever and ever guys I want you to pray for Sunday because I'm going to be bringing a message on the great white throne. I know you've heard that, but we're going to look at it. God wants me to bring this message, so we're going to look at it. And um, uh, just pray that God will give people a good sense of eternity and how long eternity really, really, truly is. I've got different things that I'm going to look at and we're going to talk about, but, but God, I really want people to focus on, on how long eternity is. You know, boy, just think, just think about a trillion years, man. A trillion years. How big is one trillion seconds? How many years is one trillion seconds? A, a trillion, keep in mind, is 1,000 billion. 1,000 billion. So a trillion seconds, if you look it up, and I'm going to give you an approximate number, is 29,000 years. 29,000 years is a trillion seconds. That's not counting a trillion years, right? Boy, so if you think about eternity as far as heaven, that's awesome. But when you begin to think about eternity as far as hell is concerned, you know, I, I tell you, it's, boy, it really, it'll get a hold of your heart. I remember.
remember Spurgeon asked this question. He said to his congregation, and to me it was just such a great question. He, just looking at eternity and how long it really is, man. Knowing that in hell you'll never get out and there's no hope of getting out. And you're going to know what the feeling of true no hope is and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it's going to be horrible. But he asked his congregation, he said, what sin in your life is so luscious to you, so precious to you, that you're willing to burn forever for it? Boy, what a question, amen? And the answer to that question is there is none. There is nothing. Guys, honestly, think about it. And these are some of the things I want to bring out on Sunday, so I don't want to, you know, preach it twice, but, but just, oh, just, just pray that the, the people will get the sense of man, how long eternity is and just, just how horrible hell is really going to be. People think they're going to be partying with their friends and all that, man. They're not going to see their friends. They're going to be in outer darkness. Boy. Whew. Well, I'll tell you what, man. It'll get a hold of you. Mm. Yes. Well, that's good. So the question is, are there different levels to hell? The Word of God doesn't teach different levels, but I will say that the Word of God does teach there's going to be different levels of punishment. And we know that because the Bible says, and you can look this up, those that knew their master's will, God Jesus said, and didn't do it, will receive, will receive many stripes. But those that didn't know their master's will, referring to himself, and did things wrong, will receive few stripes. Then he also told Pilate, remember what he told Pilate? Now, Pilate was a pagan pagan right he, he, he didn't know better he didn't know about the, the bible and all that stuff and what did jesus tell Pilate? he said those that delivered me up to you have the what the greater sin they have the greater condemnation he said why do they have the greater condemnation because they have knowledge that you as a pagan mr pilot don't have they know better so god's going to judge people based on the light based on the knowledge based on the truth that they have then also, what did he tell Sodom and Gomorrah? He said it would be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. And Sodom and Gomorrah is going to rise up in judgment against you as well. Now, we know that the Bible says they're set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, according to the book of Jude, to those that would desire to live ungodly thereafter, the Bible says. Amen? So, so when you look at um, hell, Jesus said, man, it's going to be more tolerable for them. Why? Because Jesus was there. Jesus did miracles. Jesus was the living word of God, and he told them the truth. Lot dropped the ball. He should have been a witness, but he didn't. Even his own family didn't believe in him, the Bible says. They thought that he was making, make, making a joke or making light of it. He dropped the ball. He didn't preach the word of God the way he was supposed to. But when Jesus came... Boy, he told them flat out, this is the truth. You need to repent. I'm the Messiah. And if you reject that, it's going to be more tolerable for them because they didn't have the truth like you do. Boy. And then when you're reading Romans chapter 1, what does it say? Read what it says. It says you, people that are sinning, and give approval to those that, that do, do the same things, it says. Keep reading, and it says you're storing up wrath for yourselves. You're storing up wrath. So every time you sin, there's a little bit more wrath, a little bit more punishment that God's adding to their punishment in the lake of fire. Boy. So I believe, just like we have a new body, they're going to also receive a new body when they get pulled out of, out, out of, out of um, the lake of fire. When they get pulled out of the lake of fire, they're going to receive a new body, and their, and their judgment is going to be portioned based on their knowledge and what they did and why they did what they did. And God's going to be just with every single one of them. So, yes, I don't believe there's going to be levels of hell. I know Dante wrote a book saying that he put Judas Iscariot in the lowest part of hell, you know, but all that's just made up stuff. But we do know, we do know that hell is, is real, and we do know that there's degrees of punishment based on people's knowledge and light that they have based on the Word of God. And the only one that knows the proper balance to any of that is the Lord. He's the only one that can judge people righteously and properly period yes sir
Yes, sir. I've heard it said this way, a uh, bird takes a piece of sandpaper in its mouth and pretend that the earth is a stainless steel ball. The bird's got to fly all the way around the earth. He scoops down and he scratches the surface and he flies all the way around again. And he does that until the, the ball is big enough to put into your hand. Eternity is just starting. Boy, eternity is just starting. So guys, that's where people get messed up. You know? And I'm going to show a picture of a, a tombstone on Sunday morning. And the thing that I'm going to focus in on is that little dash in between those two dates. That little dash. That little dash that makes up your whole eternity. Your whole entire eternity. You can't even see it in a drop in a bucket. You can't even say that the dash is a drop from a bucket. Because eternity is that big and that long. You can't even see it on the map. Your life is not even a blip on the screen of eternity. Boy, that's why it pays to know Jesus and be saved. Amen? Boy. Now, guys, this is the second time I've said, and I want you to see, I've got my notes all typed up on all the different signs that are taking place, natural disasters. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, the signs of the Antichrist. We're going to also talk about signs of immorality, signs of the times. Um, we're going to talk about signs of materialism, uh, signs of the fig tree. So I've got different signs that we're going to look at, and we will go through this next Wednesday. But I wanted to wrap up our our questions when it came to the underworld, when it came to these different charts when it came to Ezekiel's war we've covered that pretty thoroughly you guys have a pretty good handle on some of those things, amen but listen, I don't want to stop if you don't want to stop, I want to make sure that you guys get it, yes yes during the thousand year reign, will anybody die, that's an excellent question excellent question well, when you read in different parts of Isaiah and different parts where the Bible talks about the money rain, the Word of God teaches us that if somebody dies at the age of 100, they'll be considered cursed of the Lord, and they'll also be considered a child. So that's how we know that the Lord is going to extend uh, the time frame. Adam and Eve, they lived to be like, what, 930-something years old? But these will live to be 900 and what was it, 70-something? What is it? 69 years old, the oldest living man. So God's going to extend the lifespan of earth again. So he says if you die at the age of 100, you'll be considered a child and you'll be considered a curse of God. Now keep in mind, during the millennial reign, the Bible says that God's going to rule with a rod of iron. There'll be no war. There'll be no open rebellion. There's going to be no unchecked sin. So when people sin and get into trouble, God's going to deal with it immediately. And that's why the Bible says there's going to be nothing but peace the lion and the lamb are going to lie together. He's going to make it go back to where, like the Garden of Eden. He's going to change the, change the earth back to the way it was. So maybe like the Garden of Eden. Uh, the lion and the lamb are going to lie together. Man, that, how cool is that, man, to walk up to a lion and pet it? Amen. Wouldn't that be cool? Man, use that tiger as a pillow. Amen. Boy, that's going to be awesome. It's going to be an awesome time. And this is what's so cool, man. This, this is not Hollywood. This is a holy, awesome, infallible, indestructible word of God. Amen. Yes. God is a merciful God, and I think if people obviously are going to sin because they're in their flesh, they'll have a chance to repent, just like God gives everybody else a chance to repent. But if they don't repent and they want to continue in their, their sin, then that's where, that's where a person like that will probably lose his life, according to what I read. If you die before the age of 100, you'll be considered a child and you'll be considered cursed of the Lord. So, um, But you got to keep in mind, Christ is going to be there. He's going to be there, you know? So... The temple's going to be there, and I think the temple and all the stuff that's going on in the temple is just going to be a reminder of who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us. Constantly be a reminder. 
And yet, unfortunately, that reminder is not going to be good enough for, for some of these people that are going to rebel against the Lord during that time. This is also during the time where we're going to have, like, you know, give this person ten cities, that person five cities, give that person one city, and then the person that was lost that didn't do anything with their talent, didn't repent of their sin, they're going to hell, but give their talent to the person that has ten cities, the Bible says. That's going to be during the millennial reign where you are going to be whatever God's responsibility that God gives you to serve him, but you might be over these people that are in the flesh helping run their cities or run whatever God wants us to do. He didn't give us the details, but you can use your imagination. That's going to be awesome. Amen. And then heaven. And I want to do a whole message on heaven, man, and just talk about just if you just look at the city that's coming down out of heaven, 1,500 miles high, wide, and long. Each pearl is a single pearl, 12 pearls around that city. Think about, I, I just imagine, how big is that pearl going to have to be on a wall that goes 1,500 miles into the, into the air? Wow. Think about how big that is. And there's a mathematician. He did the square footage of this city and all the 12 layers that the Bible talks about. And if you've got to go, I understand, we're, we're, we're past the time. So if you've got to go, oh, man, I don't want to hold you up. But, but he said that if you take everybody from Adam to the, to the person, the last person to be born, so he guesstimated how many billions of people that would be, right? He said there would be, a, there would be enough to have a mansion and a, a square mile plot for each person. Still, there'd be that much room in that city. If everybody from Adam to the last person to be born died and went to heaven, there'd still be that much room. Just in that, just in that part of heaven. That's the, that's the part that comes down out of heaven. So just think about what the rest of heaven looks like. And when you read about where Satan walked before he fell, he says, man, he walked in the, in the high, high north places, the high mountains of heaven. He talks about those, those fiery storms where he walked. I mean, man, heaven's just going to be amazing. No eye has seen, no ears heard, nor has it entered into the mind of those what God has in store for those that believe. Amen? Boy, that's exciting. Amen? We're living in exciting times, but we're living in troubles at times. Yes, indeed. And if you didn't get that sheet with all those conservative news stations and all that, let me know because I want to make sure you, you guys have that because you're not going to hear a lot of the stuff on the news that you need to hear with some of those uh, sheets that we handed out with those news uh, stations on them. Any other questions at all about anything we covered today? Anything at all? You guys feel like you're getting a little bit more of a handle on it? Have you guys learned anything? Yeah? Yeah. From Kadera? Right. So what happens to them then? I mean, they all went into the water, and I've always wondered about, I mean, they're still alive because of the demons. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they probably went and possessed somebody else. Well, you also do, you read about the guy. It sounds like he repented, he got religious, he cleaned his life up and all that, and he was demon-possessed, and the demon got cast out of him. But then it says he goes into the wilderness. This demon goes into the wilderness, and then he finds seven, seven more spirits more wicked than himself, and then, and then they come and reoccupy the guy again in the first, the, the second state is worse than the first. And that's what religion gets you. It's empty. It's hollow. It's, 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 it's unredeeming. You know, religion wants to conform people from the outside. But true Christianity is a transformation from the inside done by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yes, indeed. Any other questions? Are you enjoying this? Yes. Now, now, guys, look, I know I'm a preacher. And I, and I get it. When you ask questions like this in public, oh, oh yeah, Brother Dave, we, we can't stand it. We hate it. Man, it just stinks. Is somebody going to really say that? <laughs> no, they're probably not going to say that. But in a sincere way, I truly pray that you're getting handles on it, that you're starting to grasp it, you're starting to get it. Now, listen, if you want me to continue with these things, I will. I, I want you guys to be able to have a good picture of this. Why? As I'm learning, and I found out, and I'm finding out that it's unfortunate, a lot of churches, it's true. I mean, I've, I've heard this, and I was like, well, how can you say churches don't teach this stuff? How can you say that? Well, when you begin to look and ask questions and different things, you, you find out that a lot of churches don't dive into these things. And this is a big part of the Bible. About a third of the Bible is Bible prophecy. So we, we need to understand it, and we need to know it. Why? Because what does it mean? Doesn't it put a spring in your step? Man, doesn't it get you pumped up? I know it does me. Boy, 
So that's why we studied, man, to motivate us to be soul winners, but also, man, to be motivated that, man, God's on the throne. When we watch the news, we don't have to be all irritated and mad and, and, and ticked off and like I, sometimes I get. <laughs> you see, so you're like, oh, I wish I could change that. I would. But reality is, man, God's in, God's in control, and he's got us. Amen? Boy, so you can just watch all that, this stuff, fall, the whole world fall apart around you and have peace like you've never had before. Amen? Boy. Yes. Hang in there, man. Well, I've always said it. evangelism is not the problem in church. Teaching about evangelism is not the problem in church. We have we got teaching to the wall zoo of how to be a soul winner. But the problem is it's a heart problem. You know, my brother, my brother likes fishing when the fish are biting, but he hates it when they're not. Now me, Dave Unger, man, I'm, I'm like, hey, uh, uh, hold on, there's one coming from over over there. I, I can see him swimming right now. He's, he's gonna check out my, he's gonna check out my hook. Amen. I'm always a hope, oh, hey, it's going to bite, don't worry. Man, so I love fishing. There's a big difference between liking fishing and loving fishing. And there's a difference between I like the Lord and I'm serving the Lord and, and, and I, I'm in love with the Lord. Because if you're really in love with the Lord, and I get it, every personality is different. We're not beating people up. You know, Paul was a very bold preacher. Peter was a very bold preacher. But what did he tell Timothy? Hey, Timothy, man, you don't have that spirit of fear. He was really timid, so he had to encourage him. Like, man, you're too timid, man. You've got to be a little bit bolder when you speak. Don't let anybody look down on your youth. Remember how all those things that Paul would tell him? Why? Because he was so timid. So we don't, we don't box people and say, if you're not knocking on doors and you're white-knuckled and you don't have foam coming out your mouth and you don't sweat like Pastor Dave when he teaches, then you're not doing something right. No. No. God's going to use you the way he designed you. He's going to use you and put you around people that, that he knows that you're going to influence that, that I can't. And everyone's going to have a different hat they wear. Me, I'm up in your face with scripture and this and that. That's how, that's how I am. And God brings me to a lot of people that use drugs and, and party and all the junk I used to do so they can't blow smoke up, up, up your nostril when they try to tell you lies about their sin. No, no, no. Hey, brother, I've been down that road. But now people that are raised in church, I have a difficult time sharing my testimony because I, I don't relate to someone that didn't cuss and didn't wear t-shirts that had cuss words and all kinds of horrible stuff that they used to do you know they, they were clean moral people somebody that was raised in church that has a heart for God could witness to somebody better like that than, than I probably could so God's going to use you differently so don't don't let the devil beat you up saying oh if you're not knocking on doors and doing this bed that you're wrong because God's not going to say how many souls you got God's going to say were you faithful to share the story of my son the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power and the God of salvation. Well, did you share Christ? Were you faithful to do that? That's what he's looking at. Amen? You can't save anyone. Jesus saves them all. Amen? All right. Any other questions? Brother George, close us in prayer, would you please?